Rich, or I'm a lecturer in creative writing and coach living in San Francisco. His work has appeared in the Atlantic Monthly's Unbound, Lumina, <laughs> Contra, World Star, Quarterly, 580 Split. Uh, I, uh, as I probably mentioned like way too often, I just recently finished uh, a draft of my thesis, which is a novel, and uh, it, I, I started it in his class, and uh, you know that was my first semester here. His class blew my mind. He's been kind of a uh, bit of a mentor and a hero to me. An icon. So, yes. <laughs> no, but seriously, I'm, I'm super honored uh, that Matthew's here, and so give it up for him. This is the first Tuesday that I've had off in like nine months, and it's the only Tuesday that I'm going to have off for another nine months, so it's, I'm here at Belro. Sorry, I haven't been here more, but it's because I'm working. Anyway, um, I'm so glad that you guys do this, and I'm so glad to be here. My novel is called Doubting Thomas, and read a little excerpt that I've been working on lately. Um, Thomas is a grade school teacher at a fancy Portland school that costs about 30 grand for kids to go to for year in kindergarten. And he um, was accused of sexually molesting one of his kids in his fourth grade class. He didn't do it, but he accepted a big giant settlement to go away after the accusation. And uh, um, this happens uh, shortly after. He um, was, he, they told him to get a lawyer. His school principal, who was also a friend of his, told him to get a lawyer. <coughs> and recommended this guy who we happened to have had a blind date with over a decade ago. So when he's talking about Jerome as the lawyer that represented him during the investigate, investigation. All right, and right now Thomas is at the gym. The gym had filled up a bit, and Thomas's run segments had finally become less and less taxing. Now the walk segment seemed a chore, and he wondered, did everything become a metaphor when I employed? <laughs> he looked around at the crowd, pondering. He had never weighed, deliberated, speculated, puzzled over, or reflected so much in his entire life. Looking for distractions, he focused on a young woman on a stationary bike a few feet away, talking so loudly on her phone, Thomas could hear her over the disco in his earbuds. <laughs> she said how, like, wasted she had gotten the night before, and how she hoped she wouldn't puke out her soy latte. John. He wondered if young people ever thought about the consequences like he did, about consequences like he did when he was that age. He struggled to fight impulses and to speak up for fear of who might hear, who might see. How much fun he had lost when he was so busy being appropriate all the time, playing by the rules, performing for imaginary audiences of potential future employers, college and graduate school admission panelists, bankers giving loans. Even people his age used social media to share their beliefs on controversial topics. Didn't they worry? Thomas would never post something that could be misinterpreted. Who knew who would find that stuff, keep from giving him an opportunity he had otherwise earned? He felt tempted to link to articles exposing the idiocy or hypocrisy of the Tea Party and Republicans and religious bigots, also, Second Amendment enthusiasts and school bullies and articles that aimed at reducing adolescent gay suicide. But he remained neutral, nothing negative, nothing political, and certainly nothing sexual. The, guy, the gay guys he had met out and then befriended seemed fond of shirtless gym selfies in which one flexed arm and one flexed and raised arm displayed a smear of pit hair. They linked to events with names like Bear Bus and Cockpit. At least those were honest, not pretending to be anything other than exhibitionism or a celebration of hedonism. His students' parents were the ones that drove him nuts with their narcissistic, attention-starved image crafting, each one trying to outdo the next with their humble brags. So grateful my Caitlin's offered a spot at Yale. A thousand thanks to the amazing former sen Senator First Lady Hillary Clinton for taking time out of her schedule for this beautiful letter for our little lady. In comparison to the jock straps and photos of airplane wings and world travel, Thomas's page was positively dreary. He posted about innovations in education, 
artistic photographs of Portland he had taken on his phone, and interesting articles from The Economist and The Atlantic. In fact, he went to great lengths to maximize his privacy settings up to the near paranoid standards, so Max and his nieces would never see any of the raunchy stuff others might have otherwise posted on his wall. She looked familiar, the loud and hungover one, but she could not have been a country dayer. She had never been his student, and he knew the first and last name of every student he had ever had at country day. No former country day kid would ever be anywhere near a gym that cost less than 50 bucks per month and offered no towel service, no sauna, no pool. The guy in the leg machine stacked more weight on the rack. Thomas watched him and remembered back to the date he had had with Jerome. They had met on a sex site. They were all sex sites back then, but went old school and arranged to meet in a coffee house. Perhaps because on that first meeting, Jerome came right in from work, a bit late, and wore a pair of saggy suit pants and a shirt too baggy to highlight his physique, and perhaps because his hair was also too long for how little he had, and his lips were too thin for Thomas's taste, Thomas did not find himself distracted by physical attraction. He found it easy to focus on listening to what he said, and by the end of the first half hour, Thomas found her most sexy, especially his hands and teeth. Jerome also had a J.A., which comforted Thomas, as it reminded him of his brothers. Big hands like Jake, nice teeth, and long eyelashes like James. Jerome's intense stare reminded Thomas of his mom, and the intelligence with which he barged forward in conversation made him think of his father. Thomas had been new to Portland at the time, and asked Jerome if he knew any good gay bars. Most of the gay bars in Portland pissed me off, Jerome would say. Thomas asked why, and Jerome complained that most sold the wrong booze and had cigarette machines and sold the wrong tobacco. Queer people will never be free until we stop destroying our lungs and livers. We give our money to cigarette and liquor corporations who fund lobbyists opposing equal rights, equal rights initiatives, Jerome said, stirring the sacrament into his tea. Give me a break, Thomas had said. He broke the tip of a breadstick and threw it across the table with a flirty smile. Even now, Thomas hated the word queer. He had been vocal in the, meet in the meetings leading to Country Day outlawing its use in any negative context. The kids in upper grades in high school could call themselves the word and talk about the political movement. Otherwise, first offense was a weak suspension. Second offense, expelled from the school permanently. Zero tolerance. A far cry from the high school Thomas attended. Another era. No gay characters written into TV sitcoms, no marriage equality act, no hate crime legislation, no gay straight alliance. At lunch, Thomas often used the van room door as a shortcut from study hall to the cafeteria line. The door led to the backstage of the auditorium, which separated the cafeteria by a heavy curtain. Fucking queer, he heard one day, crossing the threshold, then stood still. On the other side of the stage, two boys cornered a kid named Chad. Thomas had admired Chad almost as intensely as he avoided him. He found Chad's combination of obvious gayness and physical beauty alluring, threatening, and obscene. A head taller than most of the other boys and reed thin, his body rested at angles that brought to mind a collapsed marionette. His eyes were a blue so dark and bright they seemed consequence of some disaster. The blue you might find in the center of one in a million gray rocks at the base of a volcano. Thomas once sat a row above Chad and the bleachers in the gymnasium. The two of them and a few other students sat with books and notebooks studying while other students socialized in shop groups. Normally they weren't in the same class, but the gym teacher and the study hall teacher had both been out sick and the school only found one substitute so that the students could either study or play. A group of five or six of the cheerleading squad had rehearsed for a rally for a while, Thomas remembered, because they distracted him from his studying. When they finally stopped, they talked in a circle of five or six before they approached Chad during gym class. One of the captains smiled at Chad. Her lips were thin, like Jerome's, Thomas remembered, but she made them look thicker by using a pencil to trace outside of her lip line before she filled them with gloss that looked like pink cake frosting. Thomas had been staring at her when she suddenly broke off from her pack of friends and approached Chad. 
Hello, she said. Chad, right? Thomas tried to mind his business, to look at his book, but he found himself caught off guard by her voice. He remembered that it sounded deep and hoarse, a contrast to her delicate features and thin hair that was so blonde he could see her scalp. Hi, Chad said and smiled back. Yes, my name is Chad. She came closer, climbed onto the first row of bleachers, so she was an arm's distance of him. Come here, she said, smiling. Lean in. What? Chad asked. Lean over to me, she said. Chad didn't move, and Thomas remembered being transfixed. He couldn't take his eyes off the two, both delicate in such different ways, two rare birds sharing the same branch. Lean your face toward me, she said. Without asking why, he scooted to the edge of his bench and bent at the waist to lean down to where she stood. She took his chin into her left hand and then gently wiped her right thumb over his lips and eyes. First she looked at her thumb and then turned to her friends and said, no. Harder, one of the girls said. And Chad stayed there, resting his chin in his girl's palm, looking down into her eyes, and then she did it again. She dragged her thumb down his face, starting at the lid of his right eye and then over his lips. Hard. After, she smelled her thumb, then touched her tongue to it. Finally, she let go of Chad's chin, then jumped down from the bleachers and turned the pad of her thumb to the circle of girls. I won, she said. No lipstick, no mascara, natural. Pink bloomed where white had been in Chad's eye, and he kept one of his slender hands over it, staring at her of the other. I should fucking kill you for being so pretty, the girl said and her friends laughed behind her. She turned to them, added her laughter to theirs, and faced Chad again suddenly and spit into his open eye. Faggot, she said, and then walked into the center of the circle of girls. They absorbed her like a stray leaf into, the world, into a whirlwind and blew away. But that was the time of the girls. And that time, there had been many witnesses, including Thomas, and the other kids on the bleachers, and even the substitute teacher caught the tail end of the ordeal, and she said, spitting is unladylike. The time with the boys happened the next year. Thomas was the only witness. He was hidden in the shadows of the stacked stage platforms by the band room door as the boys shoved Chad between each other into some band lockers. Faggot, yes, cocksucker too, but queer was the word they kept repeating. Their plan to cage him in one of the empty lockers built big enough for a tuba. Fuck, one boy said, as the other had Chad in the headlock. I can't get it open. So they pushed him between each other and into the locker, calling him queer. Queer, 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 up until and including when they shoved Chad so hard into the percussion cage, his head split open on the padlock. One of the two boys lived on Thomas's block and played tag football with James. He is the one who yelled AIDS blood before they all took off. Thomas stayed still, terrified of Chad discovering him there. He crouched, tried to assess how badly Chad had been hurt. Oh no, oh no, oh no, oh no, Chad said in a strained, panic pitch, his long veins wet, stuck with blood to his forehead. Soon Chad moved to the band room door. As he got closer, Thomas could see Chad's palms were also covered in blood. Why, he said, why? Thomas backed up a step and pulled at the door, wanting it to look like he had just come in. Chad approached and looked straight at Thomas. Move, Chad said, weakly. Thomas stepped forward and Chad flinched as if Thomas were about to strike. Thomas wanted to offer to walk Chad to the nurse's office, or he wanted to walk, wanted to want to. When he couldn't find the right words, he thought, I should go with him, or at least follow. Instead, Thomas froze. The drop of Chad's blood trailing from the instrument lockers to the band room door disgusted Thomas almost as much as it frightened him. He was also relieved that the bullies chose Chad instead. More than relief, Thomas felt satisfaction a rich, smug satisfaction, so intense it, called it, it caused an internal, physical, collapsing bandaging. 
like a plug had been pulled, from adrenaline rush to a complete deflation where he felt better than Chad for being undetectable, able to contain his eccentricities, aware enough that wearing a pink bandana as a belt or patent leather shoes was not worth the consequences those choices brought on. I'm more and less, Thomas thought, shaking. More of a man and less of a fact. I will never let him win. And he never saw Chad again. But that was all 20 years ago. This was now. Thomas watched a male couple. They spotted each other on the bench press. One younger guy, one older, one black, one white. The white guy wore a tank top that read my boyfriend gave me this t-shirt. Otherwise, nothing set them apart from any other two guys at the gym. They were at ease, like his brothers, like Jerome. Come on, let's ditch this place, grab a beer. I couldn't drink another sip of this iced tea if you tied me down and forced me, Jerome had said that day on their day in the coffee shop. Sure, Thomas said, too shy to respond to the Indian guy. Taking separate cars, the two reunited 20 minutes later at a happy hour at a place near Thomas's gym. The music played, played so loudly, talking was impossible, so they drank and danced. Well, Jerome danced. Thomas could watch from the bar. Someone inhibited, he thought, as Thomas got close to the bottom of his beer. He decided to go home with Jerome. Soon, the song ended, and Jerome returned to the bar and said, It was a pleasure to meet you. You too, Thomas said, handing Jerome a small stack of cocktail napkins from the bar. Jerome wiped his forehead and a piece of, and a piece of the paper, uh, uh, leaving a tiny wet triangle stuck to his forehead. Thomas reached for his face and gently removed it. The men smiled at one another, and Thomas felt himself getting aroused. He leaned into Jerome, who looked shellacked now with the light from the disco ball and the spots reflected on the thin sheen of sweat. Jerome gently put his hand on Thomas's chest, stopped him. Not sure it's a love connection, buddy, he said. Buddy, Thomas thought. Buddy? I totally understand, Mama said, smiling. I still had a great time. The two got through the goodbyes without too much noticeable awkwardness, but Thomas wanted to puke and couldn't wait to get out of there. He went home and sat down at his desk. Waiting for his computer to warm up, he peed in the bathroom sink, looking at himself in the mirror. <coughs> he opened Jerome's profile and looked at the shirtless pictures. Thomas masturbated to the images, drank a second beer that had been in the fridge since the day he moved in and went to bed. A couple of days later, when, Jerome saw, when he saw Jerome online, he clicked his profile again. The shirtless pictures had been locked in a private folder. Impulsively, Thomas wrote, Pardon me for being so bold, but I'm curious why it wasn't a love connection for you. Any insights? The cursor blinked for a long time. Then, none that I want to share. Thomas stopped the treadmill, wiped his face in his arms. He went to the locker room where a man facing the wall stood naked. The skin in his midsection and around his butt sagged. As the man toweled off, Thomas noticed the ring on his left hand. It caught the light. Thomas skipped his shower, moved closer to the man to grab his bag from his locker, and sat down on the bench to pull on his sweatpants. The man turned around suddenly. Thomas stared up at his face, then down, the loose skin at the man's chest and waist in the flaccid penis and a mound of hair. What are you looking at, the man said. The question didn't seem unfriendly or confrontational. Sorry, Thomas said. Your ring. I was looking at your wedding ring. The man looked down to his left hand and got up and 